Greetings, folks, and welcome to our final little talk on Watchmen. This one assumes that you've finished reading the book, so if you haven't done that, please do so now. I'll wait. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed it. And now we can get on with the lecture. What I'd like to talk about today is the opening sequence of Book 12, mostly just the visual stuff. My reason for doing so is that I've noticed most students and most people with whom I talk about the book tend to see Ozymandias as a villain. I don't. And I'm going to make my case, with which you of course are always free to disagree, that Ozymandias actually makes a good decision in acting as he does. Given the information to which he has access, and given some hints that are dropped in the narrative itself. But first, let's talk about that final opening sequence. It begins with a close up of hands on a clock at midnight, with blood flowing down over the clock, the same color, of course, as we see on the bloody happy face button, which has been one of the consistent motifs throughout the book. The frame then pulls back from the initial cover to page one with a scene of mass death at Madison Square Garden, where the band Pale Horse had been playing when the monster materialized in New York. What follow are several pages of images without words, or at least without speech, as the monster is revealed in pieces. We see, for example, on the spread on page 2 and 3, that the opening band for Pale Horse is Kristallnacht, and that the ruin is not limited to Madison Square Garden. There are people crushed under fallen chunks of building. There is blood everywhere. Newspapers are blowing in the wind, with the headline reading war and a question mark. At the Utopia Theater, with the T missing from the Utopia, the movie on the bill is The Day the Earth Stood Still. And as we look at the various characters who are now dead, many of them are going to look familiar. There are characters with top knots, identifying them as members of the gang that killed Hollis Mason. On the next page, we also see the police officers, the locksmith, whom we've encountered before, the psychologist and his wife, the lesbian couple, and on the next page over, page six, the newspaper vendor, and the boy who'd been reading the pirate comic. What strikes me here most poignantly is that the newspaper vendor seems to have tried to protect the boy by shielding him with his own body. Moving back to page five, though, in the shot of the locksmith, of course the logo on his truck is Gordian Knot, that's the company he works for. There's a sign there as well identifying the Promethean Cab Company with the logo bringing light to the world. And of course, there are any number of other details in this opening sequence that we might want to discuss in class. The monster itself, of course, is never glimpsed in its entirety, nor I think really can it be. It's its fragmentary nature, I think, or rather the fragmentary nature of our glimpses of it that contribute largely to its overall horror. The detail I really wanted to focus on, though, is the title of this particular book, which is only given on page 6 after that long, silent sequence of death, and the visual ending of so many of the stories that we've been watching unfold. The title is A Stronger Loving World. But, in the glimpse of the monster that we get on this page, we see its green blood dripping down over the sign identifying the Institute for Spatial Studies. And the placement of the blood, where it is and where it isn't, is really important as well, because if you just read the letters that are not covered in blood, you get the words, or all die. So effectively, I think the title of this last chapter is A Stronger Loving World, or All Die. Or at least that's one way of reading the or all die bit. Another is that it's Moore and Gibbon, or at least Gibbon, indicating agreement with Ozymandias' strategy. 
that is Ozymandias we see by the end of the book does what he does to prevent a total global nuclear war. So he destroyed New York to save the world. And with the body of the monster, the central portion at least of the monster's body, right over the words, or all die, I think kind of indicates that Ozymandias was right. That a massive refocusing event was required to pull the world back from the brink of the nuclear war that was about to erupt. And I say was about to erupt rather than may have been about to erupt as the headlines indicated with the question marks because there are indications earlier in the text that this is definitely going to happen. That is, there are indications earlier in the text that Ozymandias is reading his society correctly. Now, when I say that the nuclear war was definitely going to erupt, or at least as definitely as you can pause it without it actually being done, what I'm referring to largely is a scene at the beginning of Book 10. It's Nixon going into the underground bunker from which he and the generals are going to direct the annihilation. The opening image is reading DEFCON 2. And on page 2, we see Nixon, of course, with the nuclear football, the machine with all the codes, handcuffed to his wrist. And in frame 9, the following exchange between operatives. Cars 1 and 2 now approaching main concourse. The presidential party is now inside the complex. Entrance Alpha remains open until DEFCON 1 is achieved. Main concourse, all units prepared to receive visitors. And it's that until DEFCON 1 is achieved that I want to focus on here. The decision has been made to go to DEFCON 1. They know this is happening. They've been projecting casualty levels and the consequences of a first strike for quite some time now and have definitely decided to go to DEFCON 1. Well, what DEFCON 1 means is active hostilities, all units in combat readiness, and missiles either in the air or expected. Now, as they're planning a first strike, which again has been made clear, and as they're taking shelter in a nuclear bunker, the only conclusion is that they are going to DEFCON 1 in preparation of launching a nuclear first strike. The text does not support any other reading. And to put this in historical perspective, at the time that the book was published, the only time the U.S. had ever been to DEFCON 2, to the best of my knowledge, was at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when already people were expecting the world to end any day because missiles were on the verge of flying. The U.S. has never been to DEFCON 1. Their status even after the 9-11 attacks, which of course were well after this book was published, was DEFCON 2, and I believe that's the last time that they were there. So, given that the world was moving toward nuclear war, and given the various adjustments in behavior that follow immediately upon the disaster in New York, the text unambiguously points towards Ozymandias having saved the world. Now, as John points out towards the end, nothing ever ends. The world isn't saved for all time, but nobody can do that, can they? Ozymandias saved the world for his time, or in his time, and really can't be answerable for anything beyond that. He guaranteed that there would be a next time, that there would be a human race to wrestle with the same questions that he and the other characters have been wrestling with throughout the book. Now, why am I dwelling on this? Much of the reason, I'll admit, is simply to be provocative and to make sure we're highlighting the notion that destroying New York can be a moral thing to do. And that in destroying New York, Adrian Veidt acted morally. A decision, by the way, that is endorsed by Dr. Manhattan's killing of Rorschach when it becomes clear that Rorschach is going to expose the plot. That is, the two characters with the broadest perspectives, with the clearest vision, both end up endorsing the same plan. Maybe not joyfully, but endorsing it nonetheless. Another reason why I'm highlighting this point is that 
and here I'm drawing on many iterations of teaching this book, I've noticed over the years what seems to me to be a desire on the part of many students to paint Ozymandias as a villain because it is uncomfortable, morally deeply uncomfortable to allow that his action could be right. And I've seen all kinds of arguments coming out of various classroom conversations. For example, the notion that he is completely instrumentalizing human beings or that there's always a hope that they could have pulled back at the last minute or any number of others that some of you may well think of on your own. And these, of course, are all worth discussing, very much worth discussing. Even Rorschach's position that one should never compromise one's moral stance, even in his words, in the face of Armageddon, which he is about to willingly unleash by revealing the truth. These are all serious and worthy contentions against my position. But that or all die under the central portion of the monster's body does seem to be an endorsement on the part of both the artists that Ozymandias was morally correct in doing what he did. Because, of course, as I've mentioned in our conversations, there is a strong Nietzschean strand in this book. And from a Nietzschean point of view, there is no transcendent value to or of anything. All value arises from life itself. There is no value outside of life. So to eliminate all life and a complete nuclear Armageddon would have done potentially just that is also to eliminate all value and all potential moral or ethical positions from which any value judgment can be made. That is, whatever else happens, and here I think Adrian is right, life must be preserved, even at the cost of truth, a nice little abstract, or one's own moral purity, another nice little abstract. And an abstract that, in the face of global annihilation, I quite frankly can't even begin to take seriously. But as we began this series of talks and this unit really in a discussion of perspective, I think that's probably where I'd like to end up. Because of course, of the mortal characters, so everybody excluding Dr. Manhattan, Adrian is the one with the broadest perspective. And his narrative is really clear about that when we read his origin story, isn't it? He goes further than Alexander, who is his model. His experience and his body of knowledge transcends the merely parochial East-West dichotomy, encompassing that and a great deal more. Where Alexander only made it as far as India, for example, Ozymandias pushes all the way through to China, encompassing that worldview or those worldviews as well. That is, he comes as close as it's possible, excluding Dr. Manhattan, to having a comprehensive worldview, one that's capable of looking at all of the other little schools of thought that make up the mosaic in which he's living and viewing them largely as a whole. This, of course, comes at a cost, doesn't it? And this cost is foreshadowed in that opening sequence of book one with the gradual loss of detail, the gradual loss of immediacy being accompanied by that ascending perspective, that ability to take in a greater range of information. And here, I think, having mentioned Nietzsche already and having actually spent some time talking about Nietzsche's notion of history and horizons, as discussed in his early work on the advantages and disadvantages of history for life, which I also believe I mentioned last class, Adrian is the one with the broadest horizons. Now, Nietzsche describes or measures the strength of a person in this work by how much history they can withstand. And here, I think, the question of his morality is also a question of horizons. Adrian has broader horizons. From within narrower horizons, and even Rorschach, I think, has narrower horizons, certainly Dan and Lori do, it's easy to see him as a monster because his limits are beyond their limits. His capacity to grasp the whole picture so dwarfs theirs 
that they really are incapable of occupying the intellectual and moral space that he occupies. He is simply the human with the broadest horizons and the strength to withstand the greatest amount of history. And because of the narrative that he's able to construct, which is a narrative and is based on a lie, other characters such as the Dan and Laurie that we see in the epilogue are capable of acting meaningfully within their own much more limited horizons. That is, Ozymandias creates a fiction within which meaning is possible and without which, I think the text argues, not only meaning but life itself might not be possible. Or as Gibbon puts it on page 6 of book 12, or all die. <laughs>